go. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series, PIMBIP for short, a joint project of ISBM US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies and the Pop Conference. I'm Carl Wilson, one of the series organizers, along with Eric Weisbart and Kimberly Mack. Um, before we get started, just a few pieces of business. Uh, one, as always, if you've missed previous sessions or want to share them with others, they're all available on Eric Weisbart's channel on YouTube. And assuming all goes well, today's event will be too. Um, most of you probably know that unfortunately we had to postpone last week's session with Matt Brennan, Brian Wright, and Sue Foley because of the weather disaster in Texas. Um, we don't have a new date for that yet, but we'll notify you on the email list as soon as we can. Um, meanwhile, coming up next Tuesday at the same time, we've got a special session on Black intimacy and R&B and hip hop in the post-civil rights era, featuring authors Antonio Randolph and Robert Patterson in conversation with Elliot Powell. So please join us for that. But now let's move on to this week's event, centering on Christy J. Wells' forthcoming book, Between Beats, The Jazz Tradition and Black Vernacular Dance from Oxford University Press. I'll just quickly introduce our participants. So Christy J. Wells is an assistant professor of musicology at Arizona State University's School of Music, Dance and Theater, as well as affiliate faculty with ASU Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. They've also been an active practitioner of social blues and jazz dancing for nearly two decades and have given dance workshops and dance history lectures locally, nationally and internationally. Their research on jazz in Harlem in the 20s and 30s has received the Wiley Housewright Dissertation Award and Irving Lowen's Article Award from the Society for American Music. And Christy will be in conversation with Gray Armstrong, a writer and instructor of Black culture, history, and dance, who teaches vernacular dance and lectures internationally, as well as being the founder of the popular site Obsidian T, a Blackness and Blues blog on Black experience and culture, anti-racism practices, and much more. And Les Gray, a postdoctorate fellow in the Department of Theater at the University of Missouri Columbia, who focuses on Black cultural production and its relationship to trauma and terror, indebted to Black radical feminism, queer theory, and disability studies. Dr. Gray is a dramaturg, collaborator, writer, and occasional performer. Um, as always, there'll be a Q&A at the end of their conversation, so please put your questions in the chat space as the presentation goes on, and then Kim Mack will use those to call on you to unmute and ask your questions at the end. And of course, comments are also welcome in the chat space, and we'll save those to share with the presenters after the session. So finally, with no further ado, Christy, please take it away. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I if you'll indulge me for just a second to to scroll through this this chat and look at all the faces in the room, I'm deeply deeply touched and uh, honored that you all are spending your time with me. Uh, I just see a lot of people here from various parts of my life who have um, profoundly influenced, nurtured, and cared for me for this work for this project um, in ways that I'm very grateful for. So. Let's let's celebrate that it's almost here, and I'm very very happy to be with you through this medium. Um, I'll also just express a little bit of of pride that we have put together for you all today an all transgender jazz studies panel, which um, yeah, um, which if it is not a first in the field, it is definitely a not nearly often enough in the field, and an, I've certainly never been to one in the field, so um, I'm I'm really excited and thrilled about that. Uh, so I'm joining you all today from about from Tempe, Arizona, about three miles south of uh, Arizona State University's Tempe campus, where I teach and work, which is one of several campuses of Arizona State University throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. And uh, I went ahead and was was looking around, and I found this statement uh, on the Facebook page of the Arizona State University. Uh, Alliance of Indigenous Peoples. So I'd like to read this statement that was put together by students from the AIP's Land Recognition Committee. Arizona State University's campuses are situated on the homelands of many tribal nations, in particular the Aotum and Pipash, and acknowledge the many Indigenous communities who reside in this territory. Um, and I will do my best with this word. Um, Skikig is the Aotum word um, that is now known as Phoenix, 
which was settled in 1881 by occupiers. The ancestors of the Oatam, the Huhugam, created canals and utilized surrounding rivers that are the basis of the current irrigation system that feeds Stikikig today. These waterways have always been the foundation and livelihood of the residents within the valley. Throughout the past 500 years, the impact of colonialism has been detrimental to the indigenous lands and languages affecting their livelihood. Many people who live in the Southwest are unaware of this history. Furthermore, ASU's indigenous student community consists of over 3000 strong, not including faculty, staff and alumni who continue to thrive, educate and advocate for the strengthening of indigenous ways of life. As the Aotum call it Himdag, the way of life for the Aotum, encompassing their culture, traditions, identity and being. As Aotum and all indigenous peoples, um, our, so there who wrote this identity is tied to the land. Um, again, like, like our own bodies, the people who wrote this, we must respect and care for it. And we urge everyone to do the same. We challenge you to educate yourselves about the history and the communities who continue to thrive today. Moving forward, it is vital to honor and respect that you are always on indigenous land. And so in, in um, considering uh, offering that statement and thinking about land acknowledgements and the various discourse about them, um, what they do, what they don't do, the, the asks to say them, the limitations of them, the desire to perhaps absolve and be absolved. I also was thinking, which is a theme throughout much of my book about um, my own subject position as a white scholar and practitioner in the fields of black music and dance, which are also um, in many ways occupied territory um, where um, there are harmful narratives, harmful practices that have been perpetrated by um, white scholars and practitioners and um, where narratives and systems have existed and exist in this space that is also unseated by the black people and black communities from which it comes and where it lives. And um, just got me thinking about uh, my own role, both in the past and moving forward in the spaces where I live and work. And, you know, I don't want to dive, dive, dive too deep into self-indulgence with that. But one thing that I've been thinking about is the platform that I have and what some things I can do with it. And one of them today is to just offer up some links to um, a few black run organizations whose work I really admire, um, nonprofits who deal in themes or, or who do work that is related to some themes I address in this book and just people who I was thinking, if you're here and you're interested in the things that I talk about in the book, the black music and dance practices and communities and histories that I write about, you may also be interested in learning about getting involved with and supporting some of these organizations. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And I put the links there and these mission statements uh, come from these organizations websites. So uh, the Black Lindy Hoppers Fund from their mission statement is a new independent program initiated by the Frankie Manning Foundation supported by the Houston Swing Dance Society. Championed by black leadership of the Lindy Hop community, its mission is to provide assistance to established and developing dancers, musicians, researchers, and community builders, endeavoring to be of greater service to community members of African and African diasporic heritage. The purpose, uh, um, and then we have the RJY Chick Web Council, uh, organization in Baltimore. And the purpose of the RJY Chick Web Council Incorporated is to advance the health and well-being of youth and adults through recreation and education to promote the sustainability and viability of the Chick Web Recreation Center in East Baltimore and to advocate for maintenance and improvements contributing to the viability of the center and the adjoining neighborhoods. I'll say that the creation of this center was one of Chick Webb's dying wishes uh, and he and his music and relationship with dancers is the subject of chapter um, three of the book. Then we have the Fort Greene Council um, in central Brooklyn. The mission of the Fort Greene Council is to provide quality programming and human service care 
that encourages and embraces seniors um, or um, to provide quality programming and human service care that encourage and embrace seniors, educate and empower children, and enrich the lives of families in a challenging, nurturing, and supportive environment. In Brooklyn, FGC provides services to the elderly from 13 senior centers in seven community districts, one daycare center, and one after school program. In 1990, they launched Jazz 966 to promote jazz in the community for seniors and the public at large. And of course, Jazz 966 is the central topic of chapter six um, of the book. And finally, Guardian Baltimore. Guardian acts as a preserver and restorer of culture and heritage by studying, teaching, and performing dance styles that emerged as modes of personal and group expression within African-American communities. Guardian is patterned after the West African model of the National Ballet, in which each country is represented by a group of rigorously trained dancers who master and perform dances particular to that group or region. African dance, Lindy Hop, Breakin, Locking, Popping, and Baltimore Club, among other dances, indigenous to black communities are at once a record of the social history of African Americans and also critical building blocks to the integrity of the community at large. Um, so these are organizations that um, I try to support um, with financial contributions as I am able. Uh, and for, for anyone who, um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy if people are, are interested in purchasing my book. If you're here, you may be considering doing that. Um, so if you're able to at the moment, if you have the means to do so, one thing you could consider doing is if you would be okay, if, if, if you would be able to purchase the book twice, effectively think about maybe doing a, a one to one dollar match for everything you're spending on a copy of this. You can maybe also consider um, giving to one of these organizations. And uh, we've got that nice 30% discount code in the email that went out about this event. So, you know, maybe if, if nothing else, you could take that 30% you're saving and re redirect it toward one of these groups. Um, so with that in mind, we'll go ahead and talk about this book, uh, Between Beats, The Jazz Tradition and Black Vernacular Dance. So I think the best way to explain the core of what the book is about and its structure is, is that the title kind of is what drives a lot of that. Uh, so the title Between Beats is both something that the choreographer, dancer, and documentarian uh, Mira Den, uh, whose work I discuss in chapter four, uh, has said about the jazz dances she observed and talking about rhythms and expressive micro timings and interaction between music and dance. And as a title, in terms of how this book is put together, it's also a kind of riff on, for people who are familiar with the world of theater and drama on Stanislavski technique for acting and the whole idea of beats of action in a narrative. So if we think about jazz history where there's been a very rust, very robust, very long standing. Uh, historiographic discourse about the jazz tradition as a narrative from Scott DeVoe's famous essay and a bunch of work before and since. Um, it's it's a narrative that's got that's very canonic and has some specific time spaces that we might call beats of action. Jazz is in this place doing this thing and then it moves to this place and does this other thing. Uh, so in this book where I'm, I'm inspired by a lot of work my colleagues do that that kind of agitates from the margins of that narrative. My goal in this book is to provoke from the center. So it, it follows that beat structure with dance focused case studies that slide a little in between to do something to subvert or question the canonic assumptions of jazz historical narratives in different canonic time spaces. So we have, for example, uh, there is a chapter, chapter two that that is at this, this discourse of jazz's ostensible origin in New Orleans and the discourses that talk about that, how those stem from discursive feedback loops that originate in the 19th century or beforehand. There is a chapter focusing on the swing era and specifically the, the fluidity of labor between different spheres of practice between Lindy Hop dancers and swing musicians. Um, there is a chapter on spaces like or, or even spaces adjacent to Minton's Playhouse to 52nd Street that kind of reorients us spatially and socially about uh, bebop music kind of tries to push against this narrative that that's when jazz stops being danceable and also asks what work that moment does of asking us to think about this music as something that's that supposedly ascends into being high art when it stops being something you can dance to. 
And after that, we have a chapter about uh, Marshall Stearns and his advocacy relationship with dancers like Leon James, Al Mins, Charlie Atkins, Honey Coles, and others at this moment where we think about jazz having some kind of institutional turn to concert halls, to the Newport Jazz Festival, to universities and those sorts of spaces. And then finally, a chapter about uh, something that's still going on today or hopefully will be going on um, again when it's safe to do so um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but a, a weekly venue uh, put on uh, by the Fort Greene Council called uh, Jazz 966 that takes place at a community center in Brooklyn. Where, where I also want to talk about the the burden that is placed on any story that you use to that goes through the present day that has to be the thing that's representing jazz now in a narrative. So uh, that's what all's in the book. I hope you enjoy reading it when you get a chance to. The only other thing that thing that I'll say about the book is um, that the theoretical concept that drives it that I really hope other people find use and value in is this idea of choreographies of listening. And uh, I'm using some ideas from dance studies and talking about bodies to give us perhaps some new tools to talk about the embodied practices of listen of listeners, which includes both dancing listeners and also seated listeners for whom stillness itself is a kind of intentional rhetorical performance, the way we might perform the rigor of listening silently and seriously, um, or that we might performatively erase our own bodies from the space to kind of create this idea that the art object on the stage is transcendent and disarticulable from its circumstances. So a lot of that draws from uh, theory from a number of people, but that I first encountered through the work of Susan Foster. And I try to put that in dialogue with um, some concepts such as uh, Kira Gaunt's discussion of kinetic orality, Guthrie Ramsey talking about community theaters, uh, Katrina Hazard Donald, um, formerly known as Katrina Hazard Gordon, and her work on the Juke Continuum, and a number, a number of other things that are in there. So the one other thing that I did want to spend some good time presenting to you all is uh, the cover art for this book, which you can see here, which I'm very, very thrilled with. And um, which was which um, we were able to commission for this book and which was done by Brandy Smith, who is a fantastic artist. So I'll read Brandy's bio for you. Brandy Smith is an award-winning mixed media artist and champion blues dancer. She holds one of those championship titles with me, but we will talk about that. Um, a native of Rockford, Illinois, her passion for art began at a young age following in the artistic footsteps of her mother and grandmother. Brandy uses mixed media and collage to express herself freely and emotionally. She tackles hard topics such as mental health and weight issues. She believes in not worrying about the straight lines or a spill on a paper. She thinks it is, it is more important to convey oneself, flaws and all, than to portray a false sense of self. She has been very lucky to have many inspirational people in her life, including her uncle Brian and her art teacher at Rock Valley College, Matthew Vincent. So initially, these were some of the ideas of, of works of art I wanted to, I had considered using for the, the book cover. I will say that in jazz studies, I think we, we have almost an embarrassment of riches of really beautiful um, black and white art photography of jazz musicians and, and dancers as well, um, which I think is wonderful, um, but I, I did want to um, move away from from that and do something different and more colorful for the book cover and more stylized. So these were some of the pieces I was looking at. And then fortunately, through a subvention grant I received from my institution from the ASU School of Music, Dance and Theater and the Herberger Institute, uh, we were able to commission an original, an original piece of artwork from Brandy Smith. So this is her piece. I'll just give you a moment to enjoy it. And I want to tell you a little bit more about Brandy as an artist and her fantastic artwork. So she is a mixed media artist and printmaker. Uh, her focus is on um, working through themes, emotions, ideas more so than just making something pretty. Uh, for her artwork is an outlet to work through emotions and current events in her own life and the world at large. Um, and these include a number of themes, including uh, blues music and dance. Um, body image, depression, anxiety, mental health, um, and uh, issues regarding race, issues regarding um, anti-blackness and white supremacy as well are major themes 
in her artwork. So I'm going to show you um, and take you through a few more pieces of it. And just a content note that some of these pieces um, contain some really difficult things, whether that's weight, weight and body image, um, or uh, histories of uh, enslavement in the United States, um, anti-Black violence and exploitation, including of children, are themes in the artwork that Brandy and I um, talked about and selected. So I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. Um, so this piece is Every Day I Have the Blues. And you can see that the lyrics to different blues songs um, are written um, on the painting and on this musician. And then if we go to the next one, a kind of very different thematic use of this technique. This is um, another print. And this is called Verbal Scars That Don't Seem to Fade. Um, and Brandy was dealing with a lot of negative self-talks from negative self-talk from things that people had said to her. And uh, here are those words remain um, on the figure's body. Um, and now for uh, this one from a series called Make America Great Again with a question mark is her piece, Make America Great Again, Jamestown, 1619. And this is a series of pieces which just through through images that may be that that may be familiar um you know to, to ask this question of what it means to say make america great again um and another piece from a series called i fit the description and uh when brandy and i were talking about this she told me that this series um was provoked by the the staging of black children for photo ops with police officers um, or as props and narratives and but that these are children who still fit the description are in danger and um, who are in danger of uh, police violence, anti black violence and who live under a system of white supremacy. Um, and then finally, I'll show this piece which is called Hendo which is um, a really touching memorial piece that Brandy did for Jonathan Henderson, um, also known as Hendo, um, a much beloved member of our blues dancing community who unfortunately passed away um, very young and someone who we loved dearly and missed very much. Um, this is, um, and, and someone who was a fantastic dancer. Um, and this piece captures the beauty of him. So um, we'll talk a little bit now about, and this is um, Brandy and I in our dance partnership. And in many ways, as we've not been able to work together, the process of working on this art has been um, a connection or an extension of our dance partnership. And in the book, there's a statement that the two of us co-authored about the process of her putting this art together. And so I will show you some some images from the process of creating the book cover and read you the statement that we wrote, which I've, I've chopped up a little bit so that it matches the, the images on the screen, but these are all words from the statement as it appears in the book. For the past two years, Brandy and Christy J have been dance partners in the social and competition blues dancing scene. That relationship is a particularly profound way to build through physical touch, a shared understanding of dance and music. Severed from this connection at time of writing by the COVID-19 pandemic, working together on this book cover has proved to be one vital way to both maintain and expand the scope and depth of our collaborative relationship as artists. In the process of co-conceiving this cover, Christy J sent Brandy a draft of the full book and she took particular has, um, inspiration from Katrina Hazard Donald, nay Katrina Hazard Gordon's concept of the juke continuum and from Christy J's description of it in the book's first chapter as, quote, a spectrum to make visible the continuities among African-American dance and movement practices as they adapt to emergent contexts that offer varying amounts of literal and figurative room for bodies to move. Brandy took individual words from and concepts from that passage, spectrum, making things vulnerable, um, movement practices, adapt to emergent, room for bodies to move, to form a conceptual basis for the artwork. This passage also inspired Brandy to choose collage as a medium by crafting the individual figures such that they could be placed in a range of backgrounds and orientations, Brandy embodied in the process of the work's creation, the notion of quote, emergent context that offer varying amounts of room for bodies to move. 
Riffing on the ideas of emergence and variation, Brandy wanted to be able to have dancers and musicians she could put into a range of spaces or backgrounds, such that she and Christy J could choose together the iteration of this flexible piece that would work best for the book cover. To craft these figures, Brandy took inspiration not only from a range of media, but also from her own embodied knowledge as a practicing social dancer. Since the book is about shifts in dance and music practices, as well as in the narratives we craft about them, Brandy created images that move from black and white to color to show the passage of time and to position the process of creation itself and that process as core sociality as central to the work's sense of flow and motion. That the musicians' um, instruments, however, remain in color points to fluidity and connection as artists within living traditions, dancers and musicians alike, speak to each other across temporal spans. In creating the background that appears on this book's cover, the imagined venue in which to place the dancers and musicians, Brandy drew inspiration from many places for Black vernacular dance in a range of times and places, including those discussed in the book, most notably the Savoy Ballroom and Jazz 966. In addition, Using collage and photographing the work from above creates natural shadows, which contribute to a sense of emergent figures. I'm showing you some of the different iterations um, that Brandy came up with. Um, in creating the background that appears on this book's cover, the imagined ven, um, oh, sorry, let me move to the next paragraph. In addition, this background, and in particular, its color palette, was inspired by the work of Harlem Renaissance artist Archibald Motley, to which Christy J introduced Brandy, and specifically the ways that Motley's color palette and use of light playfully yet poignantly embody black nightlife. And this is the background that Brandy produced. And then I'll just show it one more time, the beautiful piece of work uh, that she created. And that's, that's my whole spiel. I'm happy to get to chatting. I am gonna go ahead and drop a link to Brandy's Instagram so you can explore even more of her artwork uh, here in the chat. And I think now um, we're just gonna have some brief kind of discussion statements from, uh, from Les Gray and from Gray Armstrong. Am I going first? Yeah, go for it. Okay, great, cool. Um, I uh, I don't. There's weird light things happening, and there's a lamp, so I'll just like move it closer to me if that's a problem. Um, first of all, thank you so so much, uh, Chrissy Gage, for inviting me to this event. It is an honor and a privilege. Truly, I um, joke around that I don't really lie that often because it it requires way too much energy that I I don't have anymore. Um, so when I say uh, that I am thoroughly excited and um, just like overwhelmed with joy to be here. It is very true. Um, so I have some comments and uh, I, I do want to be aware of and respect people's times. Um, so please like cut me off if, uh, if things are getting long-winded. Um, so the first thing that I want to say, so for I am also a dancer, not nearly as good as the people that are also in this room, but I have been dancing, traveled around dancing. I wrote about it in my dissertation poorly, but it's fine. I got through. But the thing that really excited me um, as a dancer and as a person that if you kind of listen to my bio, it's like a little bit of a downer um, because I'm talking about trauma and terror and, and sad things. Um, so to read something that is like really truly at its core about black joy is just like so ridiculously like lovely and heartwarming. And I was like, man, I should do more of that, but I probably won't. Um, I really quite enjoyed the like kind of fascinating interdisciplinarity of it all. And I know like, in uh, academia, it can be kind of a, a like a bad word to talk about interdisciplinarity. But I think one of the things that Chrissy Day, uh, Chrissy Jay does really well is kind of set the the groundwork um, for other folks to build off 
of uh, these kind of uh, intersections of music and dance studies, um, musicology, ethnomusicology. Um, and I'm going to be perfectly honest, I, I do not traffic in music whatsoever, despite the fact that I do write about blues, I write about slow drag, I, I avoid the music part, I just put it over here. Um, so um, my encounters with uh, how I understand uh, this particular book are very much influenced by my uh, background in performance studies and uh, dance and theater, just want to put that out there. Um, so. Uh, the things that I really kind of uh, latched onto, because first I started reading this book like I was in a seminar again. Don't know why, couldn't help myself. And I was like, oh wait, this is not a good idea. I'm gonna be faking forever in my notes and I will have way too much uh, done. So I kind of um, latched onto three different concepts that I thought uh, were really like uh, beautifully uh, written about and um, just opened up again those points of entry that I could be like, oh, I can see uh, where my work might uh, intersect with this or like, oh, I can see where I would want to build off of this conversation. And I think Christy J very clearly like gives us receipts. Um, so they're like, look, I've done this labor for you. Now you can come join us. Um, and so I, that was like, it was, you know, a privilege. Um, so the, the three points of injury that I um, want to discuss briefly are bodies, um, embodiment, archive, and time. Um, and so in what ways do these uh, function in this particular text? Um, I was very curious. I ask a lot of questions because I'm nosy and I'm also a dramaturg. So they like pay me to ask a lot of questions and be nosy. Um, so there's a lot of questions happening. Um, and so I, I immediately was like, okay, what kind of work does this project do on black bodies, like in what ways does it offer up a historiography um, for us to like understand, uh, to grapple with the history of black bodies? Like what, what does this work give us, introduce us to that another work might not? Um, and I think one of the things that it does uh, in really interesting and thoughtful ways is point to different ways of knowing and if, uh, epistemologies uh, that give us insight into um, Black histories and culture and cultural production, and in a way that centers Black people and Black lives and Black stories, which oddly enough doesn't seem to happen a lot um, in, in a lot of fields in the humanities. Somehow um, we can write about Black people without actually centering them. So it was really uh, quite a delight to, to see that happen. I think one of the things that I also really appreciated um, that like, you know, I kind of low key knew that Christy J was a white person. So I was like, wonder what's gonna happen with that. Um, and I think they did a really um, great job of kind of like stepping in and out of the racial imagination of like kind of entertaining these different mythologies and um, the ways in which dance and music uh, uh, traffic in or traffic by white supremacy and white supremacist notions of black bodies, um, while also kind of uh, stepping back to, to let these people be um, who they were. So uh, in terms of talking about uh, bodies, I was very much struck by um, this language of like choreographies of listening. Um, and in my research, I talk about choreographies and I got a little weird with it. And I was like, I'm gonna talk about rhizomatic choreographies, which I'm not quite sure what that means still. And I really thought that this was just like a very um, like concise uh, meditation on the relationship between um, the ask of the musicians, the ask of the space, uh, the ask of white constructs in relationships what it means to um, have a black body in, in space that we regard as like hypersexual and exotic and uh, savage. And what does it mean to occupy space with music silently? Um, there, I, I had a lot of quotes that I pulled out and I was like, let me bring it down. But particularly, I really, really, really enjoyed, um, I'm gonna say that a lot. It's just, we're gonna have to be okay with it, make our peace already. Um, I really, really enjoyed um, the discussion of the quadroon balls. Uh, it was something I knew very little about. Um, there was this particular sentence that fascinated me. Um, and they said, even when white and black bodies made literal contact, as in the case of taxi dancing, distance was maintained through enacted distinctions between consumer and the consumed. And the way that my weird little brain works, I immediately thought of um, Toni Morrison. 
And in Beloved, she talks about uh, this interaction between a boy and um, the, the school teacher and that this was a moment where he learned that definitions were made by the definers and not the defined. Um, and so that really kind of brought up uh, for me like a lot of curiosity about these negotiations as they are being um, constructed and had in these spaces. Um, and like um, in terms of just even thinking about like staging uh, these moments. And that's, I'm oh, sorry, that's another thing I really love. I was uh, typing to Brandy, um, all the things I loved about her, her artwork. And to me, there's a kind of theatricality to it. Um, I discussed this with Christy J a little bit, um, that uh, of like rendering these bodies in space and moving them around um, to create different stories. Um, and so I was thinking about this spatial relationship and, and I was thinking about like, who is ensuring these distances between these white and black bodies, right? And these, um, and creating these mythologies, who do they serve? And like, uh, I was really interested in thinking about um, like Audre Lorde and uses of the erotic because we talk about um, uh, hypersexualized black bodies in these spaces frequently, but we don't talk about the kind of like effective erotic potential that they have. Like what would it mean to give um, a little bit more agency in our uh, history making uh, back to uh, these black women. Um, and uh, I was also uh, in terms of like the work that I have done around slow drag, um, there uh, is a really interesting section where it talks about um, policing and how like these bodies are policed in the Savoy. And I think it um, really kind of softly um, uh, circles around like ideas of respectability politics and like the ways that black people um, have enjoyed themselves, continue to enjoy themselves in their um, in their spheres, uh, but also in what ways do they do that um, to appear uh, to appear respectable? Like this is a, a kind of a more refined uh, dance or activity than what uh, we used to do. Um, in, in particular, thinking about the Savoy and Karen Hubbard and how she writes about how intimacy was policed with slow drag, you probably are familiar with this, um, but like that they, uh, the bouncers were like, okay, you can get to the point where you're barely in motion, but like, if you stop, we will kick you out um, because it's just like a little too sexy. And so again, there's like uh, questions of decency and respectability and how uh, they shape uh, and are shaped by black spaces. Um, and so lastly, and this is actual an actual question, um, I, I tried to, again, I'm nosy, I tried to like track your body, Christy J, across the course of this book. And, um, you know, looking at uh, the phone calls with uh, Frankie Manning and these interviews, which uh, seem delightful. And I was like, how did you get this access um, to your body on the dance floor? Like, were you following you? Were you invited by this Kwanzaa moment uh, to invoke creativity? Were you like falling in line with the soul train, which it seems like you were, um, to those painful uh, moments of looking at microfilm? And so I guess the, the question is like, like, uh, in what ways do you feel like your body shows up in this book? Um, and like, what resonances are to be had? Uh, and like, what, what did you like make of that? Les, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Gray, what do you think? Do you want to, do you want to go ahead and, and off, offer some thoughts? I'm, I'm taking notes so I can yeah, yeah, yeah. get to um, the things that Les brought up as well. Uh, I think, I mean, it, it's your show. If you want, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and jump in. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Gray Armstrong. Uh, I do a lot of work around um, black and white racial, racial interactions um, and looking at those power dynamics and how they formed and why. And also just looking at a lot of the unconscious bias that comes up uh, through these interactions that go unseen often because certain stories are untold. Uh, so I loved this book. This book was fantastic. Um, and I, I, I'm super excited to uh, read it again. I, like Les, went through at first and was taking so many notes and had so many thoughts 
And then I realized I was gonna run out of time uh, and that there was so much to read. And so I switched to a more, uh, a note-taking style that was just on my reflections as they came up. Uh, so I'd like to read a few of those and then get into some of my favorite chapters and why uh, I'd like them and some of the thoughts that came up for me. Um, so one was so many ick responses to quotations. Uh, the quotes were chosen really well um, to really reflect ideas of the era, but that of course gave me a very strong visceral response of ick. Why are they saying that? Why haven't we moved past this? But it also made me reflect on this way the language is about bodies, about Black people, about our dancing and our music hasn't changed. You could see that reflection in current day uh, discussion around things like hip hop and other things like that. Um, another one was the idea of taxi dancers that Les commented on. Um, so I had, we used the term taxi dancers in current day uh, blues and Lindy Hop communities to be a person that is welcoming to new people, uh, but to see it through the historical lens of it being traditionally um, beautiful black women, light-skinned black women who were uh, supposed to be entertaining the white guests who didn't know how to dance and making them feel good about themselves uh, was another ick moment um, and also really made me reflect on the ways that over time as as dancers as we look at the things that Frankie Manning has said or some of the other people have said and we kind of pick and choose these concepts and ideas that if we don't trace the history back far enough we can be replicating these dynamics that we don't want to be doing uh and it it reminds me of why uh I never felt comfortable being one of those dancers. I can never put my finger on it, but it was definitely something that I felt really strongly about. Was as I would always say, I'm not really the I'm not really the type for that. I'm not charming enough. I'm not. Uh, and it was an unconscious belief that like I needed to be able to be a consumable product, and that I was not the type of product that was being looked for for that type of position. Um, and that that's not of course, on the top of people's minds when they have this thing as a concept, but that is still reflected in our current relationships. Um, it was my favorite section, I think, was probably on bebop. Uh, I, in my canon of listening to music through my family's lens over time, I've listened to my grandfather's music and my mother's music, and all of those have distinct time periods along with them. And bebop, I feel, is the one that uh, escaped me the most. It's the time period I knew the least about. Um, in, in my head, I had been taught that bebop was basically rockabilly. Like, it wasn't an idea that I understood. I didn't know that this music was something totally different uh, until about last year. And I got curious about the genre. And I had heard that, oh yeah, bebop, you can't dance to bebop. I was like, okay, it's definitely that weird rockabilly music that I don't really like dancing to because it's very like aggressively white. And then I listened to it and I was like, I'm confused. Um, one, this is very clearly not in the white like category of music, but also it is danceable. You can dance to this. And so I kept running into this uh, this difference of what my body felt like was comfortable or possible to do versus what uh, the readings I was doing were saying about this music and this time era. Um, and one of the things that came up for me in specific about that was the, the concept that the tastemakers are the white community and they get to choose what of the Black community stays in the canon of um, discourse, basically. Like they get to decide what is continued to be talked about, but as Kirstie J comments, they are almost always invariably 
talking to a very particular subset of the community. They don't really have a, a viewpoint of the whole community at large of the different variations. Uh, in this case for Bebop, they were explicitly talking to um, the elite Google, uh, Google, sorry, come on, put something in the chat. <laughs> they were talking to the elite Lindy Hop dancers um, who were of the older generation by the time Bebop as a idea was starting to come around. And so if you only talk to that population, you're gonna to totally miss uh, what is happening because black culture is all about this, this turnover, this invention, this like going forward, going somewhere. And so you constantly have to look at the younger ages to watch the lineage happen. Uh, it, but for me as a black person, I felt like I could trace that because there's this concept that comes up a lot in families of, what do you know about that music? As something my mother has said, what do you know about that? And it's like, I know everything about that because that's your music and I had to listen to it because that's what you have to do. So like, it, it becomes this interesting thing to see how bebop has been taken out of the dance context to elevate it to this idea of high art, as Christian J comments in the book, um, by removing it from dance, but in part it's because of a, a blindness to a significant part of the culture and how they treat this music and what the music is about. And also this turning away from the mainstream as in black uh, white people as the audience and people thinking they were closer than they were to actually getting um, the pure experience. Uh, so I just I just found it fascinating. There's a lot of running themes about that throughout the book about people thinking they're closer than they are and they can understand things more than they do um, and not understanding their own biases in, involved in that. Uh, so I would love to hear with, from Christy J just about like, what was that like taught uh, learning and seeing bebop being danced after being taught that bebop is undanceable. Yeah. Um, so I'll thank you. Thank you, Gray, um, and thank you, Les. I will start there and just try to quickly pick up on on a few threads and themes from um, all of this sharing. And I'm so glad that we are recording this so I can go back and and marinate on on um, all of the things that you've shared. Um, when I'm a little less nervous, um, but but um, the the um, so so one thing I want to point to, great to the question you just asked, um, both in terms of seeing um, and learning about um, bebop dance and seeing it dance to whether that was in Mira Den's films or reading her writings about observing these moments in her archives or um, interviewing um, black dancers for whom bebop was their popular music and their youth who are still living and still dance to it and still can dance to it. Um, I don't know, it felt like confirmation of what it's always seemed like to me. I think, you know, a lot of my scholarship in some ways comes from that my first introduction to jazz history was through dance and dancing. Um, and as many fraught and problematic narratives, uh, many of them, you know, coming from problems in Marshall Stearns's work, which I detail, I still did have a kind of dance centric understanding of jazz that was then very discordant to what I was learning in a music school in a jazz class about when jazz really gets good, which is when it stops being dance music. So that was my first like, wait, what um, moment that um, in many ways I've been trying to reconcile and figure out since then. but. Um, but with Bebop specifically, that chapter um, is really driven and animated by, um, I want to credit the work of Charles Carson, and he has this wonderful article about smooth jazz. Um, and uh, I saw him give that as a conference paper at my first musicology conference ever. And he basically called out the field in a very productive way for saying that um, so many jazz scholars, especially white jazz scholars, are very dismissive of smooth jazz. And if you look at the numbers, that means you're dismissing the genre of jazz that has maybe the largest or one of the largest black audiences. And it's because he argued um, a lot of jazz historians are terrible at talking about the black middle class and are terrible at talking about heterogeneity among black audiences. So I, I try to keep in mind that I think that one thing that jazz studies and especially white jazz scholars can do a lot better at is um, 
dealing with the reality and heterogeneity and really talking about um, black audiences and listeners um, as they are and were, unless this speaks to some of what you were talking about as well. I think that very often um, there is this, even, even as we talk about foregrounding black heroes and black practitioners, there is this relationship almost between white interlocutors and and heroic black musicians that completely, um, if we talk about black audiences and fans at all, it's to conjure and conscript them to serve whatever narrative need we have. Um, and so I try to really move away from doing that. Um, and then related to that with that bebop chapter, but throughout a lot of my scholarship, if there's one narrative move that's kind of a style tell for me, um, I, a lot of my work kind of, I've noticed follows this pattern of, I'm going to get in there with some kind of empirical um, history and say, um, this narrative you're telling isn't a thing. Um, here's, here's the evidence, here's the receipts. Um, but now that we know that that story is not accurate, let's talk about that story. What is the work that it does? Why do we hold it? Why is it important? Um, and so I think that 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 you know talking about that bebop was popular dance music in black communities and very danceable and honoring those dancers and their creative strategies and play with time that's one part of the point of that chapter but the other point of that chapter is let's talk about this story and what work it does to say that jazz becomes serious music respectable music um when when we disarticulate it from dancing bodies as listeners um Related to that, one quick note about receipts, um, and I'm glad you noticed that one choice I made in this book that I'd encourage others to make as well. Um, I just asked Oxford to let me do footnotes rather than endnotes, and that's all it took. Um, I'm a big fan. I know other people may have a stylistic difference for readability, but for me, um, footnotes are about um, helping people reference the information in that moment. And it's, it's about both receipts and it's about accountability. So if you think there are problems in my citational practices, you wanna know why I'm saying something, where I'm getting it from, or you want to see who is and is not present and who's being cited in my text, it's right there for you at the bottom of the page. You don't have to do the work of flipping to the back. Um, so that was a choice I made on purpose. Um, I wanted to just talk about one other thing that um, Les brought up about my body across this book, um, because, you know, from beginning to end, um, I talk about myself in this moment of archival discovery that really kicked me in the gut. Um, I talk about um, myself as as present in in interviews that I've done um, as sp at in spaces in which I've danced, and I think that you know, it's important to not write this as a disembodied narrative. I tried to not fill it with, you know, just to treat my book as a forum to work out my own ambivalence and anxiety about my subject position, but there's there's some of that reflexivity. Um, it's just part of part of who I am and will be. Um, but, but also, I mean, a thing to talk about is that um, I wrote this book whilst in transition. <laughs> um, I do not have the gender presentation that I had when I started doing this work that I have now. Um, and it's a thing that I'm still thinking about and we'll probably say more about, but like clearly um, one of the reasons I think I've, I focus on and, and look at subject position is that that was a really and has been a really confusing and very deeply unmoored space for me. Um, it is a hell of a thing to write reflexively when your sense of who you are becomes very deeply disoriented. Um, and, and I think a lot of that for good and or for ill um, is and will always be a part of this text and a part of this research. Um, and then lastly, you both brought up taxi dancers and this taxi dancing moment. Um, I would love to talk and think through that more. Um, part of that comes from, I didn't, I don't know if I used the specific term in the book, but, but learning about taxi dancing and specifically at this place called the Rose Dance Land, not to be confused with the Rose Land, but the Rose Dance Land, which was this like, kind of not as upscale as the as the cotton as the cotton club um, place for white slummers in Harlem that involved this taxi dancing in the 20s. Um, in thinking about taxi dancing, especially in a book that also talks about um, concert culture and kind of Western European, we might say white concert culture um, and listening practices, got me thinking a lot about the idea of proscenium. And that a proscenium isn't just a physical barrier, but I'm thinking, what does it mean? Um, whether, and I'm thinking of 
um, bell hooks and eating the other and the ways in which um, the, the terms of encounter um, between white and black people and culture cannot be entirely ethical so long as it's mediated by the omnipresence of white supremacy got me thinking about the ways in which in this particular moment of exchange on multiple levels, um, there can be a proscenium between two bodies touching. <laughs> um, and that's that's kind of what was driving that idea. So there's plenty more to say. I've, I've got these notes, we can keep talking, but um, I'm also happy to bring you two back into the conversation, answer any questions anybody else has. I mean, I think I, I think timing wise, we're almost to the point of of shifting to the Q and A portion. Uh, but I like I I also would love to hear more. So the quadrant balls were something that was unfamiliar to me uh, prior to talking to you about this book, um, and you you talk about this experience of finding um, the, the, the piece you found that kind of started the book in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to, uh, how do I say? I would love to hear about, a little bit more about what that was like mm. uh, to have that moment and maybe even to entice the watchers to want to read this section because it's really good. Thank you. So the, the section Grace talking about is, is essentially that um, I start the, so there's a chapter about the idea of um, quadrant balls in New Orleans in the 19th century, which um, may have been um, dances that were organized um, for um, white men and, and very light skinned mixed race Creole women um, to meet and the story goes um, to, to form these kinds of um, marriage-like contractual relationships. Um, now, this is this is a story where there's a lot of dispute about the veracity of it, um, about what actually went on in these spaces, um, about what kinds of cultural contexts are necessary to understand these spaces. Um, and the work that I'm really building on in this chapter comes from Emily Clark, who writes about this idea of the plissage complex. Um, because what I'm interested in here is is less so definitively showing what's true or false about what we know and don't know about quadrant balls than about what, what kinds of narratives were built um, that I think very strongly circulate in our narratives about jazz um, and, and that we don't necessarily see as connected to um, these, these pre-jazz, not just practices, but discourses about New Orleans, its relationship to Americanness, to identity and to, to sexuality and the no negotiation thereof. Um, but but I start that chapter with a moment of, you know, I kind of had the structure for this book and because the 19th century is a little out of my depth in general, I was kind of like, I gotta have a 19th century, turn of the century New Orleans chapter and I don't know what that's really gonna be yet. So by the time I got to thinking through the voice for that chapter, I was just in the public library in New Orleans and I found um, at an advertisement for a quadrant ball in um, the Times Picayune in the 1850s. And I just suddenly had one of those gold mine jackpot, I'm such an excited researcher moments, seeing all of these advertisements for dance and dance practices. And then what I found um, as I scrolled down that same strip of advertisements was that the ads for dance parties and dancing turned into a series of ads for slave auctions and for the return of runaway slaves. And um, it was a very sobering moment in terms of my relationship with um, this topic in terms of the emotion, the giddiness I was feeling at what I had found and reminding myself of the time period um, that I'm working in in that moment in the ways that it doesn't, that I don't always viscerally honor that um, in the ways that um, I, I can and should. So I, so I brought, I tried to bring readers through a kind of performative narration of that moment into that gut check with me, um, where I then Gray, cite your piece on um, dance communities and time travel and think about the, the nostalgia for um, the 1930s and 40s with which I was brought into becoming a Lindy Hop dancer and into my initial interest in this topic in the first place. So um, 
I hope it's a moment that people find helpful in, in, in the book. I, I hesitate to call it a good moment for the reasons that I've just outlined um, for myself, but if um, I hope it's a moment in which people um, find value and can kind of connect with that there's, you know, there's always a person doing this archival research. We're not, we're not neutral. Even the empirical, the hard evidence is not neutrally gathered nor neutrally curated. Um, so I wanted to stay in my body and stay reflexive in that moment. Yeah, I, I particularly wanted to hear you speak on it because I feel like that is the, there, if there is a running theme throughout your book um, about the duality of the excitement and also the, um, the pain that goes along with jazz and the relationship between um, between the races and between expectations and the stories we tell. Uh, I just really appreciated that bit as like a kind of centering point for the whole novel. Novel. Look. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, excellent. We actually have some questions here. And I think we can start the Q&A if that's all right, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So uh, Nathaniel Sloan, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hey, everyone. Yeah, I have a baby in the background. We'll see how this goes. And Mazel uh, Tov. Thanks so much. Um, I'd love to hear Christy J speak further about how they see the axis between accountability and occlusion as an author, as in uh, you earlier spoke about including self-reflexivity and self-awareness in your narrative um, in order to hold yourself accountable. Uh, how do you balance that uh, with, you know, the potential of overshadowing the your, your the subjects and, and the stories that you're um, exploring? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. And it's definitely a thing that um, I think a lot about. Um, I don't think I always get right. Um, I'm not even the person to decide if I, if and when I get that right or not. I don't even know if I got it right in the choice I made at the start of our meeting today. Um, but, but for me, it's about a number of things. Um, one of it is again about receipts. Um, like we were saying, it's 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 in part part of that that impulse is um, that that. Um, books are not objective, they're not neutral, they're not neutrally written, they're not neutrally crafted. Um, so uh, I think that there are moments um, through different kinds of techniques. Sometimes it's performative, sometimes it's through a connection of um, the people I'm writing about's ideas and wants and, and subject positions and, and my own um, when I think that's important or when it's, it's helpful to the text. But Ultimately, it's about does it does it serve the the work in that moment, um, and and I think you're right that that um, there is a fine line because this shouldn't be a book that ultimately centers me. It's not an autobiography. Um, it wouldn't be right for me to call it a book that is about jazz music and about black vernacular dance, and then just make it about. I don't know, whatever angst I've got swimming around in my head um, in its entirety. But insofar as that's part of what's driving the interest in the framing and the narrative, I want to be transparent about that. Um, I will say that that some of the moments where I choose to lay that out more explicitly are inspired by a couple of things. One is Guthrie Ramsey in his essay, Who Hears Here, where he makes a call for some discussion of um, the the complexity the heterogeneity of white subjectivities that are fascinated with interested in involved in have desire for black music black culture um, in in different ways um, part of it is about the the um, relationship I sometimes feel or the the almost the ways in which when I'm writing about um, someone like Den or someone like Stearns, when I write about historical um, white interlocutors who probably saw themselves as anti-racist scholars seeking to be advocates um, and through, through um, narratives through the blind spots of privilege, um, I think, you know, have done a lot of harm that maybe they didn't see or, or couldn't have foreseen at the time. Um, some of that is a cautionary letter I'm writing to myself in the ways I see my subject position as in relationship with theirs, although my again my relationship with white masculinity is not what I thought it was when I started writing this book, um, 
And then also part of it comes from just the space where I feel like I can do the most and best work in this field. I was in a public conversation with Thomas de France, who's another um, hero and very generous mentor. Um, and he's also doing a, a large work on black social dance um, that I'm really excited to, to see. And um, part of what he was talking about is, is, is saying that he doesn't want to be writing all the time or even often about black dance in relationship with whiteness. Um, and that he expressed, you know, some, if not gratitude, relief that that's something I am interested in taking on because it opens up, it's, it kind of takes it off his plate. So he, he can focus on black dance in black spaces and, and black contexts. So those are, those are some of the thoughts I have as I work through this. And I don't, and, and, and I'm sure on a number of levels, the choices I make about it in future scholarship are not going to be the same as what I've, I've done here or in work in the past. Yeah, thanks. That was, that was really illuminating. And, and thanks to all the respondents here. This was a really, really enjoyable talk. Thank you, Nate. Okay, uh, Kay Goldschmidt has a question. Yeah, just really quick. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about how the majority of jazz history discourse that we all have to wade through is really geared towards a really narrow definition of virtuosity and contribution to popular culture. Like it's just mm -hmm. this, this tiny little piece. And I've been mulling over just how masculinist it is. And um, I am excited by your project because it seems to be decentering that in a lot of really crucial ways. Like look at these different types of virtuosity, look at what's happening when we talk about bebop, not just being an instrumental genre, but people were moving to it. Um, and I'm just wondering if like the conservative corners of jazz scholarship have been pushing back at all. Like if there's been a struggle because mostly I see your work as really being thoughtful and cele celebratory of parts of the story that haven't been told. Um, thank you very much for that. And to, to answer that question quickly, I would say, um, no, I haven't gotten pushback on that. And I suspect that's through um, who in our field I tend to spend my time reading and and giving my attention to um, in conversation and, and, and who I'm inspired by and where I take my cues. Um, and also in the good people at Oxford University Press, and I don't know who the reviewers were, but clearly were reviewers who were able to um, offer some really good critical advice, but kind of get what and, and be on board with the kind of jazz studies um, that I wanted to do in this book. But hey, like it's about to hit the market. We'll see what kind of reviews come out. Um, I'm, I am prepared Let's to shake things up, right? I'm, yeah, um, I'm prepared to I'm prepared to engage that discourse as it comes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Carl, Carl Wilson has a question. Yeah, um, this is coming in a little bit, a little bit uh, from the outside. But so it, there's a similar dichotomy often drawn in um, in pop and rock between um, dance music and non-dance music, and there's mm -hmm. kind of a corruption story about rock and roll becoming rock, um, and there's sort of an authenticity discourse around all of that, mm -hmm. and what your discussion of choreographies of listening made me think about are all of the things that are not quite dance and but also not sort of European concert convention stillness in listening and I just I, I've in my experience as a jazz listener I feel like I experience that in between a lot too that there's a, there's some level of moving and some level of interaction that isn't a formal concert setting but also isn't a dance floor and so I'm just wondering if like if you could comment a little bit on like those spaces in between and how they fit into the way that you're kind of rewriting this narrative around bebop. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I think that, you know, you'll see it kind of uncritically all over lots of scholarship and lots of textbooks. And I think lots of music writing is you'll see um, a dichotomization of dancing and listening as practices. 
And if the, and if there's a thing that just you know like puts a bee in my bonnet that I want to push again, it's it's that implication that that dancing is in part defined by the absence of listening, um, which for me dancing is how I listen the best. Um, so it comes from a kind of dancing dancer's perspective, and also just from me thinking that um, we could do well across. You know, m music schools, music departments, um, and maybe this is too like very my own institutional centrism in the places I operate. But one thing I'm fascinated in by a lot of music spaces is, is that they're often places of very rigorous, focused, body-oriented work, whether that's on embouchures or fingering positions or just like there's so much body work that happens, and we're so we so don't want to talk about it or think about it that way. Um, and I think it has to do with these ideas of transcendence of of art objects and and all that. But I think that dance studies is just a field that has helped me grow so much in my own language and my own facility with talking about and writing about bodies. And a big part of the the work I hope to do in this book is model an approach and model some tools that can just create, not that there hasn't been any, there certainly has been some that's really wonderful, but just another way of discourse between dance studies and especially jazz studies and popular music studies that I think can be more broadly useful again in those kinds of um, even if we wouldn't call it dance as such just those kinds of forms of listening and I think the other big thing for me is to highlight that listening is always embodied um, even if it's a performance of disembodiedness that th that that's kind of what the the idea of choreography does is there's a set of terms of engagement that bind the body within that set up boundaries for what kinds of movement gestures are permissible and that's essentially a score that a performance takes place either within or in rejection of so those are just some thoughts on things that i hope are helpful that that i you know hope scholars who work on rock may find useful in ways that i don't have the the subject matter facility to envision or anticipate but that's what we always hope our work does i think Okay, hey, uh, Carl Miller, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hey, Christy J, really great uh, presentation and I'm super excited. I have a thousand questions I could ask you and I typed one and then Kay Goldschmidt, um, whose book is just amazing, I have to give a shout out. And Carl, uh, you kind of covered some of it in here, so I'm just going to like tweak it a little bit. Um, I found it interesting that you kind of positioned yourself as not one of the scholars that's looking to change the jazz narrative as we've inherited it from uh, by paying attention to the margins, but by paying attention to the center. I thought that was a really great, uh, you know, interesting and productive. And so I just, if we step away from your book for a second, how might we imagine teaching now that we have your research, um, how might we imagine teaching a jazz history course uh, differently, and what are some of the what are some of the ways in which our kind of narrative uh, necessarily changes? Um, I loved uh, you know the Charles Carson intervention is is great, um, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to think like, okay, how does a jazz history course change once we start thinking about uh, dance and bodies and all that? And then if you want to, uh, like the next extrapolation would be, how do university music departments change if we start taking uh, your research and findings seriously? Oh, um, wow. Those are, those are, <laughs> those are questions. Those are important questions that I want to practice good stewardship of. Um, and I thank you for them. Uh, the first thing that came into my head as you were saying that is um, less talked about, and I am honored that they read this book as as foregrounding or centering black joy and um i think that's a great place to start for what a jazz history course looks like could be like um now i say that with the idea that um that um centering black joy through a white lens or white gaze um has its own um really troubling really problematic history that i know you that that i take inspiration from your work and how i write about so so the connections between folklorism and minstrelism you know i'm the last person to tell carl miller about so um the, so 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 but with that caveat i think that um that's one I, but i think that also means um centering 
black communities and spaces and not just heroes and not just canonic figures. Um, but, but what are the communal spaces? What are the, who are the audiences? Um, what are the communities of praxis rather than the great men um, that shape, um, that shape this music? Um, you know, Vanessa Bly Tremblay has talked, for example, about how um, bad studies is it talking about motherhood. And I think that's um, another thing that we could do, um, that we could do a much better job with. So, you know, I think that, that, that um, part of me wants to say it's about um, centering communities and communities of practice more than centering um, great man narratives and, and, and more to the point, not just having, um, and we're talking about this a lot in the, the Lindy Hop dance community and blues dancing community right now as well. Not just, not just centering black heroes, but centering black ontologies and epistemologies and modes of pedagogy and modes of learning. And I've learned a lot about that from Ray Armstrong, who is, um, on this zoom right now. So I think that that's part of it too, is, is, um, it's not just a shift in content. It's a paradigmatic shift that I'm not appropriate to be the person to drive exactly what that call is and, and what it looks like. And I would say the same thing in music departments and schools as well. Um, we need to, um, you know, as Philip Ewell has talked about with the white racial frame, we need to, we need to not just include, include, um, F non-white forms of music, dance, and art, but to al allow our institutions be radically transformed, reshaped, or smashed and rebuilt from the ground up um, in a more equitable way, in a way that, that doesn't force um, non-white people, communities, art forms um, to, to make themselves and their work curated and legible to and for us only in the ways in which we understand um, or want. So there's there's tons more to say about that by people who are better equipped to say it than I am, but those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Christy Jay, Gray and Les. Um, please join us next week when Antonio Randolph will be here to discuss her book in progress, That's My Heart. Queering Intimacy in Hip Hop Culture, 